thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, have been here and have uh, seen all those wonderful talks. I'm, I'm really dazzled by all those uh, uh, very original and, and really mind-blowing uh, uh, pieces of artwork, uh, among others, uh, that have been presented to you. I'm afraid my talk is uh, might be the most theoretical of the day, so uh, you're the brave ones. Uh, you're, you're still sticking around. Um, but, but bear with me for just uh, well, about 20 minutes. Um, so we've seen a lot of uh, well, uh, like I said, mind-blowing applications. Uh, what I'm interested in, in the first instance, what I always start uh, looking at firstly, is how people use technology in an everyday sense, in everyday life, in an everyday context. And indeed, as Michelle already foreshadowed, um, actually, if we, if we think about it, uh, it about the question, how do we define technologies in that everyday context? Well, then we wind up with uh, a notion like this. Uh, it's not that you can have a very strict definition, but you can sort of vaguely sense the way in which people uh, generally look at technology when they use it in their everyday lives. And so technology in, in that context can be defined as what I call solidified efficiency. It's sort of a materialized, although that term is dangerous, as, as we will see later on, materialized version, sort of a solid version of uh, the principle of efficiency. Something that makes you, or that enables you to do things that you did without the technology, or perhaps didn't do, uh, but you have the technology now, and you can do it more efficiently. Uh, so cheaper, faster, easier, etc. And so, Actually, Marshall McLuhan, one of my favorite scholars in the philosophy of technology and media, um, actually pretty much started out defining technologies that way, as most of you will probably know. Um, McLuhan defined technologies and, and media, sort of, he used those terms um, well, interchangeably, used them as synonyms. Uh, so he defines media and technologies as extensions of the human being. So we, we uh, project something, we project the human capacity into a technology which makes us do the thing we do with the technology more effectively, more efficiently. Uh, but of course this is not where the story ends. Because uh, what happens is in McLuhan's, uh, story, well, in McLuhan's theory is that technologies start to generate all these side effects uh, technologies do something, uh, put in more contemporary terms, um, and they create a certain world. Uh, and the world that one technology creates or helps to create is not the, the same world as the world that another technology creates. And so they create these effects, and of course these effects start to feed back upon the human being, and so you have this sort of feedback loop, feed-forward loop. Um, in which, of course, the, the simple story or a simplistic story that technology is just about efficiency is undermined. And the contemporary philosophy of technology actually pretty much builds on that insight. Um, so, so this is pretty much the way in which uh, we use uh, technologies like ICT, information and uh, uh, communication technologies, digital media, mostly in everyday life when we use them. But actually, and this is how the reasoning goes, they are like this. And of course not literally like this. This is sort of a metaphorical representation of what technology, so to speak, actually are beyond merely efficient use. So it's, uh, uh, our, our computer that we're using, our smartphone that we're using to accomplish a certain goal is of course incorporated in a whole network of um, the relations, uh, of things coming together, and uh, it's, well, theoretically, it's even impossible uh, to map that whole network, but we can definitely try to map part of it. And so, in a lot of streams within the philosophy of technology of today, you get this very interesting, I think, dichotomy between two modes, two modes of access, two modes in which we encounter technology or can encounter technology. The first one is so efficiency-driven, it's the 
the mode we are first in, the, most, the, the mode we are mostly in. Uh, and the second one is the broader mode, it's the wider mode, uh, the mode in which we are starting to become aware of the wider networks and the wider impacts that that technology creates um, or helps to create, because I don't want to be a technological determinist. Um, and so, um, the, 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 we are first in the first mode, and only with some effort, with some time, with some uh, work, we wind up in the, in the second mode, or maybe if our technology gets broken, uh, we are slowly confronted with, uh, you know, this thing doesn't work, uh, what's wrong with it, and we need to go uh, explore the further network beyond the, the efficient fluid use. Uh, but there are problems with this view, I think. First of all, there's something very good about it. It's a relational view, which replaces the, the, the dualist view, which is typical for the modernist heritage that we still uh, live in, uh, which split subject and object. Uh, so those are, of course, very abstract philosophical notions. But uh, especially Descartes was famous for splitting those two entities. Um, and so uh, this is a heritage that we sort of carry with us. And a lot of approaches in, philosophy, in, in contemporary philosophy, of, of course, go against the grain of that. And so this is good. So it's a relational view. It goes beyond the simple split between subject and object. And so people speak of quasi-object, hybrids. Uh, cyborg, uh, assemblages, fluid assemblages, imbroglios, all those terms are very beautiful terms to, to sort of get a sense of how these things are actually always interrelated. Subject and object is not split. Uh, you, the human being and technology are actually continuous. They're, they're not two separate entities. But there's still a problem because most of the time we're stuck in mode one. Like I already suggested, we're first of all in mode 1. So how do we get to mode 2 in everyday life, once again? Because uh, a lot of philosophers of technology have no trouble in getting to mode 2. But here's the question of everyday life. Mostly we are stuck in mode 1. And uh, of course the question is also, how did we get there in the first instance? And this is really a matter of epistemology, of um, our, well, our filters the filters that sort of taint the way in which we look at the world and our epistemological presuppositions, so what we uh, accept or what we uh, suppose as, well, the underlying uh, groundwork for the way in which we look at the world. Uh, but there's more, because it's not only an epistemological question, if you look at the way in which technology evolves, and I'm speaking, of course, in very broad terms here, I'm, I'm very much generalizing, but there's really, you can get a sense of this. You can get a sense of this development, and I think none of you will have trouble in, in, in grasping this. Uh, if you look at the, the evolution of technology, if you sort of try to project into the future, what you see is, like, you have a lot of applications nowadays, like brain implants, but these are just, this is just a sample of the, the most striking uh, illustrations, uh, Internet of Things, nanobots, uh, algorithms, uh, just read an article today in the paper about clothing that uh, is being made responsive to brain waves, which you can sort of project uh, the, the, the mood in which you are at the moment. So if you say, okay, I want to be left alone, this could be sort of represented in the color of your clothing or something. Um, and this attests, uh, at least to me, to a sort of evolution in the direction of, well, of course this is very straightforward, the further blurring of that dividing line between the human and technology, but also more and more difficulty to define technology, to, to uh, precisely locate technology, to say where technology is. And I had another uh, example here, which if you, if you don't, uh, if you can't imagine the evolution I'm talking about just yet, this is already uh, with us here. Uh, the, the, in my uh, iCal application, automatically the Verblijf in Volkshotel, uh, where I stayed last night, it's a beautiful hotel by the way, um, was automatically added to my agenda uh, based on, of course, 
uh, what the algorithms of Apple uh, read in my email. Um, I don't remember there was any email uh, that I received specifically about a booking at, at Fox Hotel, so I think this is pretty stunning. It's also a bit creepy, I think, but uh, you can be uh, sure that in 20 years from now we, we will find this very normal. And so, there's no question here anymore in the end of first using technology for efficiency and then becoming aware of wider networks. No, in fact, the two modes are collapsing. Uh, like the subject-object economy has collapsed before. And in fact, if you look at it further, the, the two modes that I talked about are pretty much remnants of that duality. So we have to take serious, really serious, the notion of ubiquity. Uh, of course, this is exactly the, the theme of the conference here. And you guys already figured it out, uh, obviously. Um, and so you, I would see this conference as, as, as very much a a playing with these themes and an exploring of these themes. But the question can still be asked, what epistemology are we using? So which glasses are on our nose? And I already spoke of filters. Filters is also a good image to, to talk about this. It's really the worldview. So what presuppositions do we cherish uh, of which we are not aware, but that still filter the way in which we perceive the world? And actually, I picked up this, this line from the Fiverr website um, that sort of uh, struck me uh, and, and which I want to, to elaborate on. Uh, in the theme description, there's the sentence, In secret laboratories and with self-built instruments, irrational, my emphasis, my emphasis, irrational work processes were embraced. Well, of course, indeed, the irrational work processes, if we would look at it, those are irrational work processes. But are they really rational if you look at them from the processes themselves? No, in fact, they're just as rational. And I want to elaborate a little bit on this. But, just to do that, we need another pair of glasses. And here I think the notion of goals can be uh, instrumental. Now, goals... The world today, at least in our Western culture, the world today is filled with goals. We're, we constantly talk about targets and key performance indicators and other uh, types of, of management language. Uh, but the interesting thing is that efficiency, which is another buzzword uh, and another uh, uh, very important uh, notion if you look at the, the societal discourse, because we're, we're very fond of efficiency, we see it as an ideal that needs to be attained in all sorts of societal domains. Uh, a, a phenomenon that I call efficiency thinking, it's the obsessive uh, focus on efficiency. Well, if you look at efficiency, it is a matter of goals, of course. Uh, you, you want to achieve a goal uh, faster, cheaper, etc. But in itself, efficiency is goal neutral. Efficiency itself does not talk about goals. Efficiency is just a calculation of input in terms of output or vice versa. But it doesn't say anything about the goal in itself. So that's why I call it goal neutral. Um, and so this is a strange thing. We talk a lot about goals and we talk a lot about efficiency, but actually, do we, don't we take goals for granted? Uh, or at least a concept. Um, and the same counts for, for efficiency. We take efficiency for granted, but actually there's, there's much more to it. And this uh, becomes apparent when you start to look at the, the history of efficiency. And in fact, that history is pretty recent. Efficiency as such, is a, in, in the terms of a societal discourse, is pretty recent. It's more recent than you would think. It's not a, a matter of the last decades. It goes back at least until the beginning of the 20th century, end of 19th century. There was already an efficiency craze back then, but it's not much newer. And here I would like to talk a little bit about uh, Morris Berman. Uh, Michelle announced that I would talk about Gregory Bateson. I won't talk about Bateson in, in the direct sense, but in an indirect sense he will be present here because Morris Berman, his central source, is actually Gregory Bateson. Uh, and so the, the, the whole uh, theoretical perspective sort of filters uh, or sort of uh, slides into uh, what Berman says. Now, uh, he makes this analysis of a historical evolution in our thinking about goals. And he distinguishes two paradigms, largely two paradigms. 
One is about participation. And it's the dominant paradigm until, say, very simplistically, the enlightenment and the emergence of natural science. And here the notion of imminent purpose is central. So in this kind of world, goals are given extrinsically or intrinsically. Um, you could sort of equate it with the Aristotelian worldview, but there are other uh, approaches, of course, also. But uh, that's the most famous example. For Aristotle, all things have their own inherent goal to fulfill, have their own purpose. And actually, the whole universe is a very ordered constellation, is a very ordered whole in which each, each thing has its place. Uh, and so goals are given extrinsically by a god or something, or intrinsically, it's in the things themselves. And then with the Enlightenment, natural science, you slowly get the emergence of a new paradigm, a radically new paradigm, because they can't differ more. And Berman calls it non-participation. Non it's all about purposive manipulation, he says. Because now we start to assign goals. We as humans start to assign goals, and we find or make means to attain them. Of course, you must start to think about technology now, because technology is one of those means we develop to achieve our goals. But the important thing is, we do it now. Which, of course, has consequences also in an ecological sense, uh, because we start to regard ourselves as the masters of the world, of the universe, and we can do with nature whatever we, we, we want. So this is also the uh, consequence in terms of a, of a cultural critique, which Berman, of course, makes. And so, here comes in alchemy, because Berman makes this very interesting uh, analysis of alchemy. He sees alchemy as the paradigm science of participation. It's really, literally, he puts it that way. And uh, he goes against the grain in his uh, analysis uh, of what he calls a simplistic utilitarian uh, utilitarian interpretation of alchemy, which is very much in line with what I call nowadays efficiency thinking, of course. And he starts to refer to Carl Gustav Jung, a famous psychoanalyst, um, who has written a lot about alchemy and sort of sees in alchemy uh, a convergence with his own thinking about the mind and the unconscious, etc. And he defines alchemy as a map of the uh, human unconscious. And he also shows, so Jung shows, that alchemists were very much aware of the psychic aspect, aspect of their work. But Berman says this doesn't go far enough. Because what, what uh, Jung actually does, in his view, is just simply uh, reduce alchemy to the, the, the consciousness side, to, to the mind side. And actually alchemy is about more than that. Uh, and I want to read this longer citation. To, to really grasp the, the, the idea that he wants to put forward. So this is Berman. If we ask, what is the alchemist doing? What is he actually doing? We get a, 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 a different kind of problem. And so he says, what was actually going on was what the alchemist was doing, not what we moderns with our non-participating consciousness would do if we could be transported back to the 14th century. Had we belonged to that era, we would have possessed a participating consciousness and necessarily would have been doing what the alchemist was doing. Thus, the question, what was the alchemist actually doing, can have no meaningful answer in modern terms. And the crux of the matter is uh, these two notions, mind and matter. And these two notions are also central in Bateson's work, by the way. So we see the two as separate, which comes forth from, from, from our Cartesian heritage. But alchemists saw them as one. Thus, they saw no two. So th this is the, the sort of the mind trick that you have to pull with yourself. You sort of try to uh, imagine yourself in living in a world with a completely different epistemology. And so, given the epistemological lenses, the presence of those lenses, Berman says it is not merely the, merely the case that men conceive of matter as possessing mind in those days but rather that in those days, matter did possess mind, actually did so. Which is a, a, an idea that we can hardly imagine anymore, of course, because our filters are so very dominant, even though we don't always uh, consciously uh, realize that. So, back to technology. What is rational? What is irrational? Berman also makes this interesting analysis about the roots of technology partly in magic. 
Because magic is also a process of trying to manipulate reality, something that of course we have talked about a lot today. Trying to manipulate reality. Uh, but so magic is a sort of a forerunner of technology, but what happened was that the mechanistic worldview, or what Berman calls technology itself, won. So he says the whole alchemical imagery of things being themselves and their opposites, this is a matter of paradox, also something that has been uh, mentioned today, or possessing inherent ambiguity was now regarded as stupid. So the epistemological lenses changed, and suddenly this idea was stupid. So the way we see and talk about the world defines what the world is. This is actually the basic idea. And if we apply this to technology, so how do we look at our technologies, how do we define technology, uh, we can ask the question, given this uh, reasoning, given this line of reasoning, which epistemology actually frames our way of looking at technology? And so perhaps we should define technology anew. Already going into that direction is that analysis of two modes, which I talked about in the beginning. So contemporary philosophy of technology already goes a long way in defining technology. Yet what I think is that we still, we still largely see technology from the perspective of uh, the mechanistic or materialist worldview, which might be one of the reasons why we're stuck in the first instance in that first mode. And so the, the funny thing is actually the the analyses of Berman and Bateson brings us at this point, but uh, ambiguously enough, they themselves still see technology also in that way. This is a discussion for another time, uh, it's mainly a theoretical problem, uh, but so there's still some work in trying to uh, morph their definitions into the more contemporary versions that philosophy of technology gives. So, in closing, can we find a participative definition of technology? Uh, a couple of suggestions in that direction. Maybe we should think of goals as something that we, humans, together with technology, set and achieve, or not. Where is goal setting? Where is goal setting? Perhaps it's distributed, and here pops up again the notion of ubiquity. We should reflect on that efficiency thinking, rehabilitate the notion of purpose, uh, in opposition to our obsession with targets and goals, etc. And in general, and this is a hard task because we like to define things and we like to put labels on things, but maybe we should start refusing to know what technology is. Just start uh, very Socratically and refuse to know in advance what technology is. And I hope that I've sort of uh, demolished um, the, the idea that we can uh, define technology straightforward and easily in my talk here today. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, earlier today, um, we had heard a definition of technology being what happens when science thinks it's found the answer, which was kind of uh, I thought an interesting and good definition. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions? Anything from the floor? Yeah? Um, so you were taking a very difficult perspective on what technology is uh, as a design of people having taken into terms how to change this epistemological uh, viewpoint as an epistemological so viewpoint. So for designers, how to change the epistemological viewpoint. Yeah, how yeah. to make design objects from your perspective of what designers are. There's no straightforward answer. I mean, there's no recipe or something that I can give you. Uh, I think some of the projects that I've seen here today, or some of those that are in the exposition, um, definitely play with themes that I've tried to uh, circle around. Um, but I don't think there's a there's a straightforward answer. I think, well, w one one line. But this is just one line, and it's a highly individual line. Is try to imagine yourself in the first instance um, beyond that mind and matter split. And this is already a challenging task, uh, and one that I also have difficulties with because our, like I said, our intellectual heritage is so strong and dominant 
uh, that we have the, the greatest trouble in doing this. Uh, but try to imagine that those are actually uh, not split up as sort of that you can try to imagine technology as an organism, for instance, which a lot of um, artists that work with technology do, actually. There's a lot of interesting artworks, not only the ones that are here, but, but others too. Um, and so I guess the answer to your question would be art is one venue, is one way. Yeah, um, oh, we have another question here. Yeah, the, 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 the last sentence you had was refuse that you know what technology is. And it's a stupid statement, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how, how, how I should bring my mind to not believe that. Yeah, how to refuse what technology is, yeah, yeah. That last yeah, to statement. refuse to know what technology is. Refuse to know, is. sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's sort of a, a provocation, of course. I mean, because uh, the, the, the interesting thing is, um, if you look at that definition with two modes, and uh, the first mode is the efficiency-oriented mode, well, there's also a, a, a fundamental truth to it, if I can put it that way, uh, in the sense that if you want to use a technology, you have to take it for granted. That's also a given. Um, um, so if I want to use my smartphone, I, I can be thinking about uh, the way it was constructed, like I think Lucy Parika showed the, the slide with all the minerals. I can be thinking about that all the time. Like where do all the components come from and what are the political uh, implications? Because I would do, if I would do that and remain doing that, I wouldn't use the, the, the technology anymore. Very, put very simplicity. But there's something to it. And so at a certain point you have to take it for granted. Um, but I think what I want to say here is that given, again, that intellectual heritage that is, I think, still largely materialistically oriented, uh, we're inclined still, and even in the philosophy of technology nowadays, there's often implicitly this idea of technology as a thing. Technology as uh, a material thing even, or an immaterial thing that's also possible, like in the world of apps. Those are in between material and immaterial. Uh, but still implicitly there's this notion of it's something that we can grasp or something that is neatly circumscribable and I think I want to go against the grain of that go, go against that and that is sort of the, the provocative like little push like refuse to know what it is we have to we have to accept what it is to a certain point if you want to use it but apart from that refuse to know what it is that's probably not a sufficient answer but it's a, uh, Thinking in process, I guess. Yeah, we had two two more questions. So we have uh, class here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, you said efficiency was goal neutral. I, I wasn't sure what you meant with that, because it seems to be it's a specific mode. It says it's about the economy of needs, and uh, well, let's say the economy is already certainly not a neutral uh, uh, concept. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I was wondering what you meant with goal neutral. Yeah, uh, I, I went a little bit quickly there. Um, so I think uh, um, a very important distinction has to be made between how we generally talk about efficiency in societal debates, in public debates for instance, or how politicians talk about efficiency, because they talk a lot about efficiency. And efficiency defined in a more structural way, in a more rigorous analytical way. Uh, and I guess the, the analytical way is what I try to get at by saying it is goal neutral. So indeed, but in even, even then, it's better to do something with that. It's clearly there's an optimization idea. There's certain yeah. problems where it's about being better doing that. <coughs> that means. Yeah. Yeah. Regardless of what means they are. Yeah. 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 Whether you strive efficient, efficiently towards an, eco an economy that is meant to grow uh, and keeps growing, or whether you try to efficiently um, regulate and, and steer an economy that is just meant to stay healthy and maybe in a steady state, those are different kind of goals. Um, and actually, the, the efficiency itself, in the structural sense, uh, stands apart from the discussion about those goals. 
That's I think what I meant. So you can charge efficiency with different kinds of codes. Definitely. That's the I think that's a big point we should make because um, on the basis of maybe my speedy treatment here, uh, you maybe assume that I'm against efficiency. I'm not against efficiency. I'm critical towards efficiency thinking. I'm very much for efficiency as such. I think we can do a lot of good things efficiently. And like you said, ef efficiency can do a lot of good things. Um, and personally, I'm, I'm also very much a fan of efficiency. So efficiently maybe going to the... <laughs> In the name of efficiency, yeah, we, we, I think we need to, uh, we do need to move on. Um, so, thank you very much. Thank you.